Kiana Glanton is a development intern who leads a number of fundraising events and efforts at Lighthouse Guild, including corporate and community partnerships, engagement with donors, and the Visionary Committee, supporting adaptive sports initiatives and event planning. She recently also drove around the Lighthouse Guild's participation in the TD Five Borough Bike Tour, which included a team of more than 30 riders raising funds and building awareness. I was there, it was a hard 40 miles. <laughs> Ms. Glanton has experience as a research coordinator with Stony Brook University, as well as in operation. In addition, she received vocational rehabilitation training here at, Lighthou at Lighthouse Guild and worked with our low vision doctors. Currently, Kiana participates on Team USA, Go USA, <laughs> and has completed international, competed internationally in blind baseball. So give it up for everybody here and I'll leave it to Kiana. Thank you. Good evening. This is so awkward. No, I gotta hold this because it's ghetto. Okay. Good, meet, good evening, everyone. I hope you had some refreshments. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and your world to join us in this conversation. My introduction to adaptive athletics and technology is pretty recent over the last four years, really, of losing my sight. And the lighthouse has been an absolute lighthouse to me. So this evening, we're going to talk about audio description. We're going to talk about entertainment, entertainment and the ways in which blind and low vision people consume media. Everyone always asks, how do you watch TV? How do you see TV? How do you get on TikTok? How do you, can you see me? How many fingers do I have up? All these really interesting questions that we are so ingenious that we have figured out ways to participate and to be active in our community. This evening, we have a really awesome panel. We have Peter from Spectrum who just hosted our presentation about the new audio description app. Say hi. Hey. 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 Okay. Thank you for the applause. Next, we have Fitz Martin, member of Five Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. He is also a producer of hip hop, R&B, reggae music for over 20 years. And he also volunteers and teaches Braille here at Lighthouse Guild. Hey, Fitz. Next, we have someone I've known for a long time when we were camp counselors at Camp Helen Keller. Alfonso McFadden is a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. He is also a teacher of technology at Visions. He is also a member of the New York Knights goalball team. And he is also a DJ, an active DJ, a pretty good one, I would say myself. He goes by DJ Magic. Hey, DJ Magic. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the only female on this panel, Rebecca Rosenberg, member of the Lighthouse Guild Visionary Board. She is a CEO and founder of Reboca app. She's also in her early mid twenties. So go Rebecca for being that fine. Her app is available on all the app platforms where you can buy it or download it. It's actually free, but she'll talk more about that. Um, I'm gonna give you guys all the opportunity to answer the same questions. And audience, this is an interactive discussion. If you feel so compelled, please raise your hand if you have something to add to this or you have a question. They have, each person on this panel has a unique um, experience and relationship to entertainment um, and audio visual things. So some people up here are high partials, meaning they have some sight, some are totally blind. And as we know, visually impaired people are our conditions and our visual acuity is on the spectrum. So no one experience is unique and no, no one app or no one modality will fit everyone. So hopefully tonight we'll share tips and tricks and experiences about our ways of engaging in entertainment. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so to my panel, and we'll start with Rebecca. Can you guys hear me in the back? Okay, we'll start with Rebecca of Roboca. What was your first experience with accessible technology? Yeah, so um, just to give a little bit of background, I have albinism, which is a rare genetic condition that causes my vision impairment. So I have always had a vision impairment. I've always kind of seen the world in this way. So I don't have the experience of actually having lost my vision. And so um, I was introduced to assistive technology and, and accessible technology very early in my life. 
But my, my one real experience that I remember as I was kind of coming out of my childhood where things were just kind of happening to or for me, and I was moving into actually being an advocate for my own experience was right as I was going into college, I was taken for sort of a technology meeting and the organization that I was working with at the time where I was living, uh, where my family's from, they, they brought me into this big room and they were showing me all of these uh, devices. And it was mostly um, CCTVs and some sort of VR goggle type devices. And they were like, okay, you know, this is what you're gonna use to, to access the devices or the, um, the paper and, and the tests that you're gonna have at school. And it was, you know, a, a very large device, like a tabletop thing. And they were like, and here is the luggage that you are going to use to take this around to all of your classes. And I was like, okay, um, you know, and as they went on, it was like, and it's going to be $5,000. And um, even at 17, I was kind of like, um, I'm not sure I'm going to use that enough to justify that price point. And so I said, you know, do you have anything else? And the only thing at that time that they could really offer me was an audio recorder, a digital audio recorder. And so that was the first time I kind of had experienced kind of as an adult, what the assistive technology landscape looked like for people like me. And it really was eye-opening to say, okay, these are kind of the options that are available. And I think there's some space in the middle that maybe is worth filling with something something else. Thank you. We'll pass you the microphone. Magic. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Alfonso McFadden, going by the name of Magic, as you hear Ms. Glanton um, enunciating. I am from the Bronx, New York. Oh. All right. um, <laughs> um, my first introduction to adaptive technology was, I guess I'm going about to outdate myself here, with an Apple 2E. I don't know if any of you guys remember those devices, but it was an old Apple computer with that green screen, and it had the real choppy uh, double talk voice attached to it yeah. that came out of a little speaker. Um, so that was my first introduction to um, technology. And then, of course, like um, the young lady right next to me, that was way too expensive for me to be able to afford for myself. So I did adjust and adapt with um, using a device called a Braille and Speak. I know you got a lot of you guys know what that is and <laughs> mine's is gone. They will not repair it anymore. But um, that was my world of uh, being able to communicate, take down notes, um, take down my notes in classes, uh, just everyday travel and dealing with people. And um, from then I went into uh, music heavily because you know being not, not being able to see that was one of the things that kept me entertained. So I've you know destroyed a few turntables that weren't supposed to be scratched and mixed with. Uh, popped a couple of tapes, you know, rewinding things like that. But um, at the present moment, I'm using a virtual DJ, uh, which is accessible with Jaws. And I also uh, do music production using the Sonar and Cakewalk script with Jaws. And um, that's pretty much it right now. I'm not going to take up a lot of time because I know I'm going to come back around and have to answer some more questions. Yes, you are. Right. Sip take it, it easy. Thank you. No, I got a mic. I got a Good afternoon, y'all. My name is Fitz Martin. I am a music producer. Um, my first time with technology, right? Um, adaptive technology, I would say perhaps was the CCTV at Lavelle. Um, I went to Lavelle. Um, CCTV, and just like Alfonso here, I had the, um, and I still have mine, um, the Braille and Speak. I still got my Braille and Speak, and you know, it, it works, but you got to keep it plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> and what I love about it is that, you know, it was my first phone book, so I can still find y'all number in there somewhere. <laughs> um, I've been a music producer for the last 20 years, since 1999, March 99, I opened my studio in Brooklyn. 
Um, I'm guided by Special Ed, which is a cousin of mine. He's a musician that had a um, rap song back in um, the 80s. You know, I got it made, I got it made. I got land in the sand of the West Indies. Yes, that's, so that's my cousin, that's my guide. Um, I've been the fly on the wall around him. You know, Tupac, Biggie, everybody came through his studio. His studio is called the Dollar Cab Lab. And this is where I learned everything, pretty much being the fly on the wall till I took over mine own studio in 99. Thank you. All right. Oh my gosh. I, it's awful being, oh, wow. This dumb thing doesn't like me. I'll stay, stay farther away. Okay. Up it. Okay, there you go. No, this is making it worse. All right. Um, I'll lean forward maybe. There we go. Um, okay, so my name is Peter Kuchiravi. I am. I have no relations to Biggie or Tupac. <laughs> uh, not that exciting, but um, I I am originally from Ukraine, and so when I when we first moved to the states, um, I learned a few years later that I was starting to lose my sight, and the the it was most likely due to the fact that I was born near Chernobyl, uh, Ukraine, where the the big catastrophe of 1986 happened, and that um, given how young I was, I was probably affected by the radiation that had come through uh, that area and the radioactive dust that had covered and polluted the entire territory. And so um, losing your sight as an immigrant child with no parents that can support you was definitely a, an interesting journey and one that left me with absolutely no assistive technology for a long time. Um, I ended up dropping out of high school at 15 years old um, and later finding college, but not until after I discovered the assistive technology that I needed. So my introduction to assistive technology really came from, um, all right, everybody on this panel has been dating themselves except for our first person, but um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in and date myself here too and say that I, I found uh, assistance. It was a place called the Center for the Visually Impaired uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I called them, uh, I found them through 411. I just called 411 one day when I got desperate enough. And I said, find me help for people who can't see well <laughs> and can't speak English very well. And, uh, and so I got an operator on the phone and the operator helped me to connect to um, vocational rehabilitation. They got me in touch with that center and that's where I discovered. And by that point, I had lost so much sight um, that I really needed to jump into non-visual uh, technology like JAWS and stuff. So I learned how to use JAWS on a floppy disk. <laughs> uh, but uh, indeed, years before that, I did get introduced to one of those bulky uh, CCTVs that rolled around on wheels. Um, and that thing did not work very well because I'd lost my central sight first. Uh, and then it started spreading into my peripheral vision as well. So that was my first introduction. And now I'm really fortunate uh, to, be, uh, to be in a position to influence the way technology is built or thought about from an uh, accessibility standpoint. Wow. Thank you. Okay, somebody has to do that. <laughs> somebody fix that. Okay, the next question What are the unique challenges? that VI people, for those at home, visually impaired people, what are the challenges that VI people face inter, um, with engaging in visual media? So any one of you guys can jump in on this. We, we don't all have to answer this. Anyone feel compelled? What are the challenges, the unique challenges that VI people face consuming and interacting with visual media? And if you don't answer, I'm gonna call I'm you. I'm about to jump in there, I guess, since I'm, I come from a cable company, so I guess I should jump in here. Um, I, one of the biggest challenges that, that blind or visually impaired people face is obviously the fact that if there's no way to understand what's happening visually on the screen, there's no audio description, there's no way to interact with any interface that's connected to it. Uh, I mean, you're effectively left out. There's no other way to, there's no other way to think about that. So, you know, to the extent possible, you know, we're fortunate to be in a position where we can affect that change. Uh, if there's a user interface that a person interacts with, it needs to be accessible, period, right? There has to be some sort of text-to-speech or screen reader software engagement with that platform. 
And if there's content and there's audio description tied to that content, then the user needs to, needs to have access to it. I personally won't watch a movie or a show without audio description. I just, I realize that I don't have the same level of engagement. I have ADD for sure. You know, I definitely have an attention deficit. I'll start fiddling before I know it. I'm solving math problems in my head in the middle of a movie if I don't have the audio description needed. So that's, you know, that's the piece we're completely left out if it's not there. I think that's important what you brought up, feeling left out, right? When you're in a world of sighted people and everyone is watching the movie and you have no idea that the killer just came in the room, you just hear the ominous music, dun, 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 and you don't know what's happening. But what I appreciate that the direction that Spectrum is going in is being able to provide this audio description opportunity for so many movies and television shows. So that's really exciting. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that. Um, to my panel, who gets it right? What app, program, or platform gets it right in terms of being able to ex access it? I'm not jumping in. <laughs> Absolutely none of them. <laughs> the person who's on Facebook all the time. <laughs> um, there's always some sort of hiccups when it comes to adaptive software and um, apps and technology, um, mainly based on the fact that these applications are constantly updating so when they update it kind of breaks things so, so to speak as far as the scripting language that works with the uh speech software like jaws or voiceover or things like that so then they have to go back and rewrite scripts to make them accessible so for the most part they try to get it right but there's always something that has a glitch and i purposely think like they do it on purpose just to make the money and be able to keep upgrading and doing things that keep us interested so but that's that's just my take on it. Can I interject a little bit? Um, sure. I usually I'm the last one to up, update. I'm the last one to update because I don't want nothing to change. I want to be able to use my phone. I want you be able to use my computer the same way I use it every day. So I'm usually you know late on the updates. No, I like the challenge. I want to go out the gate and see what's going on with the situation. <laughs> I do a lot of beta testing and upset myself when it doesn't work so yeah i mean i gotta bounce out this music tonight or this thug gonna beat me up <laughs> you know i can't take that chance i think rebecca is probably a little biased because she has her own company here but we'd like to hear your perspective on it because you actually created your own app yeah absolutely so uh, you know, I, I would like to think that at, at least in, in some vertical, our company does a, a pretty good job, but, you know, I continue to recognize that we have places where we fall short. I think to your points about when updates are made, sometimes things will break. I know that even for a technology that our company is developing that doesn't have nearly as many features as something like JAWS or something like, you know, Instagram or Facebook. We spend a lot of time making sure that voiceover still works, that all of the accessibility features that we have built in still do work. Um, and so I really can't imagine how much additional time it would take to do that or, and it does take to do that for a platform like Facebook. And so it, isn't necessarily surprising to me that that's maybe one of the things that slips through the cracks. Um, and obviously that's not good, that's not what we want, um, but it is something that I think technology companies need to be more aware of that as they're making what may seem like small changes to a sighted user about, you know, oh, we just moved the button like two inches to the left. Okay, well, did you also test to make sure that the voiceover still works now that that button has moved two inches to the left? I knew she was gonna have the right answer. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Panel, can you give me an example or a scenario that you really needed um, an accessibility feature regarding media and entertainment and it wasn't there? Or you were unable to access it? For example, you're on Facebook and someone put up a flyer but you could not read the time that the event was gonna start. Or um, there's a song, a melody is happening. There's a video playing, and you have no idea if this is a RIP or if this is Welcome New Baby. Can you give any uh, um, experiences 
that you guys face interacting? Okay. Um, when it comes to PDFs, I have a real problem with PDFs. Um, if the you know the name for the artist is written in P on a PDF in a PDF form, my computer may not read it. Um, you know, as an engineer, when it goes to you know um, doing some compression or maybe some EQ, and if uh, if a parameter is not being read, then you know. Um, I would, you know, so sometimes you got to put a direct parameter and if the voiceover is not reading it, I'm totally lost. You know, um, this, before I even started with voiceover, I had to have an assistant. Um, voiceover kind of, you know, cut, cut his job down, but it's still needed. Yeah. I actually have also had experiences, even, even as someone who is more on the partially sighted side. I have enough vision to have a driver's license. Um, I have, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that was a nice flex. Thank you. You know, if I can take an aside for just a second, it really still is a very scary process. And it's something I talk to people a lot about, you know, it's, it's really challenging and really scary and something that it takes a lot of time and effort and to, and a lot of kind of just trusting yourself to, to build the ability to do. Um, but anyway, where I was going with that was, um, I actually had one particular experience where I was at a restaurant that, you know, has those like menu boards that are up behind the cashier. So I can't see those no matter what, like they could be the most accessible versions of a restaurant menu and I would still have a hard time. But this particular menu had these like, you know, the, the picnic table sort of red checkerboard pattern. Okay. It had that behind the black text and I'm looking at this and I'm like, I, I cannot, this is even with my zoom and our technology didn't exist yet. Even with my zoom, I like could not figure out what this said. And I asked my, my friend next to me who totally normal vision. I was like, do you know what that says? And he was like, no, I have no idea. And so uh, I, I like to say that part of the reason assistive technology needs to exist is because bad graphic design exists. And so I think there's something to be said for how much making things accessible can actually just help everybody and make everybody's life a little bit easier. I know that I have missed like very significant movie plot points because I can't tell the two characters who are brothers apart. And then apparently, apparently that was the whole movie. And at the very end, I was like, oh, you know, that was so sad. And they're like, yeah, I can't believe the brother died. And I was like, what? <laughs> I thought that was the brother. It wasn't. Anybody else want to add to that? I, I totally get that. I, I, you know, I'll add to it myself. Watching Game of Thrones was awful. I mean, the best show ever next to A Different World and The Cosby Show. But Game of Thrones, if you have any sight, it is the darkest cinematography ever I mean I know it's medieval and they didn't have light bulbs but it is challenging and so I just remember like being really close to the tv and trying to see these dragons and these, these little dungeons and I the plot is so complicated that if someone didn't explain to me what was happening I just couldn't keep up and it's a cult cult classic so I, I want to be in the, the discussion I want to talk to my family about it I cannot so I'm texting everyone don't tell me anything until I can sit one foot away from the tv when no one is watching and be really close up on the TV. Um, and around that time is the first time I actually found a TV that had accessibility. I didn't know, I just stumbled on it. It happened to be Magic TV, as a matter of fact. And it was talking and I was like, what, how, how, what, how is this happening? What is this magic that is happening on this TV? <laughs> I had no idea that these things existed. So that leads me to my next question. How do you share information and how do you learn information about new technology? I found that peers have been incredibly helpful, but to everyone on the panel, how do you consume and how do you share information about what works and what doesn't? Well, I'll jump, I'll jump in here. So word of mouth is really effective because it keeps traveling. It's a, it's a little monster that never stops, right? People talk, it's like the, the game of telephone. You tell somebody one thing and it keeps going. Uh, so word of mouth is really effective and sharing with your friends and sharing with your family, but um, the other thing that exists in our world right now is social media. 
So we're all using social media. And by the way, if I could chime in on the last question in any way, I would say when people post pictures that don't have description, alt text or any form of description, um, then you know you might as well just be leaving the blind people out entirely. But um, but sharing on social media, and it's an area you know that even as a company we're exploring with it as an, as an accessibility team rather that we're exploring, can we share on social media? Um, everybody's on social media now, whether it's, uh, you know, the old dinosaurs like Facebook or the new things like TikTok, uh, people are hanging out there and learning information for better or for worse. Um, and might as well, we get on there and share some real information about what is actually um, available, what's real. And just like, you know, uh, DJ Magic was sharing, sometimes things up we live in a world that updates so rapidly now. I mean, from day to day, you're probably getting updates to your Facebook. You're probably getting updates to any application that you have. You're getting updates to your Windows software. I had that happen to me today while I was trying to work on something in my hotel room, my Windows software decided it was time for an update and it was going to interrupt me. So updates happen more regularly now uh, than you probably, you know, uh, blink, <laughs> you know, they're rapid. And, and that's something that companies really embrace. They want to be able to rapidly innovate and move quickly. As soon as a new feature can be pushed, they want to push it out, right? Um, and that can affect things negatively for a person who uses uh, screen reader technology or any other type of assistive technology. And so being able to follow posts or blogs or um, social media accounts that share that, I think is really valuable because it can sometimes be the difference between knowing, okay, well, this company no longer cares about me uh, and, or wait, there's an update that happened. There's gonna be a fix that's a fast follow. Um, so I think it's good to stay connected on social media. Thank you. I'd like everyone to answer that question if they're up to it. Well, um, for me, the, um, the internet is definitely my friend. Um, I'm constantly Googling and researching and looking into different articles. Um, you could you could just look into New York Times, newspapers, um, encyclopedias, blogs, as uh, the gentleman said as well. Yeah, encyclopedias. You might not look at it, but I do. <laughs> I need to understand what I'm trying to trans transcribe and translate when I'm doing scripting. Because there are situations, like you said, with the updating, where they call somebody like me to go in and do some scripting language and write different things so that that software becomes accessible for an individual. And I get those calls a lot when it comes to job placement and people need a job save and they don't want to lose their job. And you know, I have to do some research on Google. Google is definitely my friend. Most of my media is consumed through my cell phone right now. Um, YouTube is my best friend. Um, <laughs> and uh, also he said Google, you know, I Google a lot. Um, but most of my media comes from my phone and my computer. I would also just say, in addition to everything that ha has already been discussed, that as a, someone who is partially kind of making my livelihood right now off of understanding where people find out about assistive technology, um, organizations like Lighthouse Guild are really, really fantastic. Um, and a lot of people who tend to come back to me and say, hey, you know, I've been using your technology. I, you know, these are my thoughts. A lot of them say that they come from Lighthouse and that organizations like Lighthouse are the place where they find our, our device or our technology. And so I would say that there's a really big space for low vision support organizations um, everywhere and of every kind to be continuing to, to do the work that they're doing because it really does make a difference for people. Um, and it really is one of the main places that I have seen um, people in our network find out about the technology that we've built. Thank you. The reason I asked that question is because there are people that are tuning in via Zoom. There are people here in person who don't know anything about getting on the internet by themselves or how to watch a show by themselves. And so there's a level of a learning curve that's really steep. 
when we decide to empower ourselves and engage in media um, in the ways that we do. I have actually found that TikTok is really, really helpful. There's a, um, a whole algorithm, Blind Talk. If you, if you put Blind T-O-K into your search engine on TikTok, you'll find a bunch of blind content creators, people that are in our area, people that are across the country and all over that are sharing their experiences with accessorizing, sharing their experiences with food shopping, with getting dressed, raising children and being a blind or a partially sighted parent. There are a lot of um, opportunities online and definitely here in the lighthouse. And if you have suggestions, you're welcome to share them with us and we'll continue to share them with you because really our community benefits when we share information. So thank you guys. Okay, next question. What are the challenges that we are facing as we move forward in technology. There's a bunch of changes that are happening. So how do we give feedback and what are some of those challenges that we're facing as VI people, visually impaired people, consuming entertainment and media? Let me know if I need to break that down again. I think that there's a whole lot to be discussed. So. Uh, one of the, the things that I, I talk about a lot is how there are so many advances in technology that are happening every single day. Right now, sort of the hot conversation is around artificial intelligence. And there are so, so, so many ways that artificial intelligence, specifically computer vision, can be leveraged to aid people, not just with vision impairment, but all kinds of disabilities. And I think that one really good way for us as a, a low vision community to advocate for ourselves is to be pushing for these new technologies to be embedded in the technology that's made available to us and for us. And not 10 years from now, as the technology is actually being built, as these new capabilities are coming forward, um, because uh, Again, it's one of those things where by creating technology that that helps us, our population, um, we are almost by definition kind of helping everybody um, in ways that I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize. And so I think one way that we can really help to, we one way that we can really help ourselves is to continue to push technology companies to think about generative AI and how that can be applied to the lives of people with disabilities. Um, I'll add and say that I think one of the biggest challenges is representation. So, and I'm sorry, you guys, if I'm talk talking quietly, I'm trying to get this thing not to squeal at you. Um, representation is a big one. I mean, people can have the best intent at heart, uh, but I think we've all, or at least most of us have seen companies or small startups that are trying to solve problems for you where they've they, you know, they show up and they've built a cane that can talk to you and vibrate in your hand and do a dance or whatever it is. And they think it's going to help solve your, your every problem that you have. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, and it just electrocutes you in the rain. Um, so the, you know, representation, um, companies who are wanting to solve problems uh, within the disability space need to hire people with disabilities who can who can who can help inform that product from the inside and say no this is an absurd idea and you only have that idea because you've got this canned perspective of how we people with disabilities function in our daily lives so if you hire people with disabilities then you can uh you can avoid a lot of those pitfalls completely agree did you guys want to add on that or are we skipping that fit? Okay, no problem. So to the panel, what advice do we have to newly visually impaired individuals, the people who have not found their tribe or not yet connected um, to an organization like the Lighthouse? What are the first steps and what were the most useful steps for you in being able to get to where you are now? All right, um, connecting to the Lighthouse. Um, or any kind of service like the Lighthouse or Visions, um, make sure you learn Braille. A lot of people are not learning Braille. Um, it's not a lost, um, what's the word I'm looking for, language or whatever. Because, you know, even when you get on an elevator, 
you're going to need that Braille to get to the next level or wherever you need. And Braille, you don't have to be a reader of Braille. You don't have to be, a, a, a you know, like you're going to read a book or anything, but at least be able to, you know, do signs like, all right, if you're a cook, you know, you could put black pepper on this or whatever it may be, and you put it in Braille. So don't think about Braille only just to read a book. You know, think about being able to direct yourself and keep yourself safe, even with medicines. You, you can put, you know, penicillin or put a P on there or, you know, so you don't, you know, hurt yourself. I can share something. Um, role models. That's a big one for me. I grew up as, as I started losing my sight, especially coming from an immigrant community that ha had a very skewed perspective. We got the we got the crummy microphone on this side, huh? Or something. Or we're sitting in the <laughs> fence. You and I, we got the wrong. Yeah. All right. Um, oh yeah, let's do it. Hello. Yes. Thank Problem you. solved. All right. Um, oh man, I can open my voice box now. I was really trying to work with that microphone. So, uh, role models was a big one for me. I went a long time. My only perspective of what it meant to be blind or visually impaired came from a very, very skewed perspective that had everything to do with you are handicapped and you're gonna to have to be taken care of for the rest of your life. That's what people with disabilities, yeah. that's how they were seen. And when I, when I started to get advice, I'm gonna say something just, just, just slightly controversial, just slightly. When I started getting advice from sighted people about how to live my life as a blind person, mm -hmm. I got really agitated because this was coming from people who had no idea what I was going through. And every single time that I got a sighted person telling me what to do or how to live my life, I just got that more frustrated because I was like, you actually have no idea uh, what it's like to be me. And of course, being a, being a teenager or whatever, I, I had that you know sort of pent up energy too. But the moment that I found another, another blind person who had done it herself, she had gone through schooling. She raised the child as, as a mother, as a single blind mother, put herself through college, put herself through a master's program, got a job, was successful, and was now my role model, my mentor. That changed my entire outlook on life. I no longer had the ability to make excuses and to say, well, you just don't know what it's like to be me. <laughs> I now had to live up to that new standard that I just found. Uh, and this person who could tell me how they did it and show me the light, right? So um, yes, I absolutely agree with Fitz. Finding, finding a place like the Lighthouse, finding other organizations that have positive representations of what it means to be a person with a disability is super important. Thank you. Magic. Um. My best advice to anyone who's newly visually impaired um, is to just not be afraid. There's a lot of fear that, you know, you, you captivate within yourself because you just don't know how you're going to deal with this new situation. And there's a lot out there, whether you want to acknowledge it or not, that can help you. And um, there's a lot of networking that can be done, a lot of research. The technology is just really out there now. And there's really at this point no reason for fear um there's a plethora of uh technology whether it be software hardware to even all the way down to the ancient pen and paper with this bold line now that will allow you to be as successful as possible with your everyday activity so for me just just don't be afraid and if you're not afraid you, you'll get through a lot trust me Hi, so I think I I come from a, a kind of a, a different experience just because I have had my vision impairment my whole life. I will say with that, I didn't necessarily know actually that I had albinism until I was in my early 20s. Um, so really only a few years ago. Um, and I had not ever met somebody else with a vision impairment similar to mine until I was 22. Um, and the way that I ended up doing that was by getting involved with NOAA 
which is the albinism organization in the United States. They're fantastic. And when I finally got connected with Noah, I don't think I, I realized that I didn't know what I had been missing in terms of connecting with other people who really understood my experience and could say, oh no, you do, you do that because you have a vision impairment. Like you operate your Apple watch with your nose because it's already that close to your face. Um, and I, so I would just, you know, echo the sentiments that have been made so far that finding an organization that is appropriate for you, whether that is Lighthouse or maybe a, um, a vision disorder specific organization is a really good way to start to come to terms with the experience that you're having and really learn how to thrive um, with that vision impairment because it absolutely is possible. Thank you. So I'd like to pose a question to the audience because we do have some people in here that are experts in entertainment, whether it's through sports, there are some athletes that are in here. They're also members of the New York State Commission for the Blind. What advice do you have to newly visually impaired people who are trying to engage and interface with media? So, yeah. Yes, I got Brian over here, another Brian. You can introduce yourself. Brian. Hey, Brian Velasco from New York City, 32 years old. Oh, my fault, my fault. So advice I will give you, and by the way, thank you to all the panelists for coming out and you know talking about all your organizations, all the work that you do. I work for Omnium Circus, and we are America's first fully inclusive circus, which provides audio description, ASL. At, shoot. It's all right, it's a little further away. Okay. Well, did everybody hear me? Yeah. Yep. All right, yep. cool. So yeah, I left you at the ASL part. And most importantly, we are sensory adaptable. So every performance, there are sensory adaptations and relaxed seating. So advice I would give to everyone is this. Advice I would give to everyone is this. Go, okay, go with your gut. Let me, let me not use the mic. Because no, it's okay. It's okay, you don't need it. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, go with your gut. Go with don't your gut. Don't let fear, don't let your disability impede your dreams. I've said this to all the people. Even our performers at the circus are diverse. We have an aerialist with no legs who does amazing aerials. So that whatever career path you have, go for it. I little did I know I was gonna be ring mastering in the middle of a freaking ring on a stage at the New York Institute. So just, you know, life takes you in unexpected journeys that you don't expect. And, it, and you discover hidden talents. It's up to you to find them and reach for the stars. So I commend all of y'all, congratulations. And by the way, um, so the Bread and Speak people, we gotta get together and throw it back with a little bit of Simon and Dino, man. We gotta throw it back. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. 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 We have another, another comment. We'll hold it further away. That's all. okay. Yeah, I'm scared Just of like the bike. That. Just like that. Hey, Gas. Hi, um, my name is Yasmin, and I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for having this event. Um, I am Yasmin Campbell, and I am, I guess I can put on my AP hat, American Council of the Blind hat today. Um, I am the first vice president of the state of New York, and I'm also in our local chapter, the membership uh, person and our social media person. So um, I wanted to say that definitely finding a support network is really crucial. Um, it definitely helped me. It definitely has taken me on a journey that I never thought I'd be on. I still have a little bit of vision left. Um, I am a mom and, a, you know, raising a teenager. So, you know, we are in the social media age right now. And um, I definitely am one of those creators on TikTok. Um, so I know with Kiana's talking about the blind talk, I was very happy to see that there's such a big community there. Um, but definitely finding a network where you're able to, um, you know, share information and, you know, be a support to others because it's definitely difficult to have to deal with losing your sight. 
And um, I just wanted to say, uh, if Alfonso, you know, hey, to the fellow Greek, I'm a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. So we like to connect. And Rebecca, if we, I definitely I think our chapter would love to hear more about your company as well. We have started an audio description um, group. So we're trying to get that, you know, up off the ground. Um, I think I would say that we, in my chapter, the Greater New York Council of the Blind, we do have a lot of like older members. So that may be, they're afraid of technology. They're afraid of move, like, you know, even using like their smartphones and, and things like that. So if we could find ways to help them, you know, feel more comfortable about it, about using the technology that's out there for us. Um, you know, we're open to a, any suggestions, but I just want to We say, can work yeah, with that. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Yaz. I'm coming to everyone, don't worry. I'm coming around. That's all right, I saw someone back in the further back. Just over a little further away. So yeah. Hi, uh, Tiffany. Um, I've actually never had full sight, so I cannot, like, my advice really would be to go exploring with different kinds of media and find out whether it's audio or visual media, even though it might be a bit tricky, but sometimes they do work together well. And I guess find little pockets of joy. Do you have those like moments where you're like kind of freaked out, like my life isn't going to be the same? Find tiny pockets of joy. And that'll keep you going. Thank you. I Thank saw you. more hands back here. We got Barbara. I'm coming back. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. Yeah. Yeah, sure. We'll switch. That way we don't have that going on. Go ahead, Barbara. There's just so many resources and, and opportunities to assist everybody in this room. We're in the Lighthouse, everybody, the Commission for Point, we're all here to help. And we've got one goal to get everybody safe, independent, and back to work and paying taxes to New York State. <laughs> Yikes. Thank you, Barbara Campbell from the New York State Thank you, Barbara. We, we, Tiana, we have more people want to comment. Is that okay? Yes, good, yes. Right? we can continue. We All have right, a good. More. Let's continue. Yes, my name is Jason Camacho, and I'd love to build and fix computers, and that's my passion. Um, being that I was born visually impaired, I always think about this. I don't think of it as a as a handicap. I think of it as a as a physical challenge. Like kind of like a a challenging cheat code for a game, you know, like to make it even harder. So I always say this for someone that first starts, put that best foot forward and keep on and keep on trucking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Aaron. Hey, um, my name is Aaron Graham. I'm a software engineer. And um, one piece of advice that I think is really important, especially for people who are new to having vision loss or, or in being in the low vision community, is that it's really, really easy to find people who are really negative and just want to complain and just make everything sound so bad. And it's just so important to find people who will be positive influences in your life. And this is my first time at the Lighthouse today in New York City. And every single person who I've met today was so positive and so uplifting. I recently lost my job. So I've been like in a tough place and everyone who I've met today has made me feel so much more empowered. And I think that for anybody, just find those positive lights and let them shine their light on you so that you can continue to shine on other people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. And I'm moving a little bit further down and we got you right here. How you doing? Hello, everybody. My name is Crystal Allen and- um, Hey, Crystal, hey. Eyes Like Mine Incorporated. Hey, Tiana. <laughs> um, I wanna say thank you to the panelists also because everybody shares some great <laughs> gems. Um, I am also the newly Miss Newark USA crowned. And um, Woo. I wanted to share with you guys um, 
if you're you know when we first start losing our eyesight we're in that figuring out stage adjustment to vision loss is a continuous process so i would just say you know just try something once continue to build your curiosity and it's okay to feel however you're feeling whether you're angry sad depressed or just numb because you'll feel all of those things at some point or another um, but it gives you the opportunity to accept your lifestyle as a person who's visually impaired or blind as well as you meet more powerhouse people in the blindness community and even feel free to make your own adaptations you know you don't have to follow everything by the book you know it's an opportunity to find yourself within this journey because um, I know when I began losing my eyesight, I was 16. And just like Rebecca, I never met anyone else who was visually impaired or blind. So I had a lot of figuring out to do. And I always keep my hands in a little bit of everything as of today. <laughs> so it's okay to find you within this. It's, it's not all lost and there's still life after blindness. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you, Crystal. Do we have anyone else who wants to make a comment? Yep, coming over. See a hand going up there. Coming on over. Hey, everybody. My name is Thomas Reed. And um, yeah, I think I wanted to just echo a, a bunch of what was said, but also offer another avenue. Um, because I know for lots of people, including myself, when I lost my sight 20 years ago, I had just moved out of the Bronx into the Poconos. And so my access was not there. Um, and so sometimes it's really hard to meet the people. And that's what we're talking about because people are really, really important to that adjustment process. So I just wanna offer that there's a lot, and yes, I have one too, but a podcast where people, you can actually meet people without leaving your home. You can hear people's story. So whether they're podcasts, whether they're blogs, whether they're whatever, YouTube, all of that stuff, there's lots of content but it's not just content to just consume. I mean, for us, and depending on where you are in your process, this is content that can get you to the next step, right? And so I just wanna encourage folks to, to do that, to seek that out, um, because there's lots of stuff, like I said. And yes, mine is a podcast too. <laughs> Read my mind radio, just gonna throw it out there. Uh, all to the EID, but yeah, so so um, definitely check it out because there's lots of, lots of different people. Um, and again, you can even go, beyond blindness. And I know sometimes we like to really stay focused within the blindness community, but I heard some folks kind of take it out away from that and say, yes, disability. Because, you know, we share a lot within the community, even outside of blindness. And I think we can get, whether it's real tactics, um, encouragement, whatever the case may be, but there's lots of places to get it. Thanks. Thank you. And for those um, who just Thank heard you. that gentleman speak, Thomas Reed is a audio narrator. He is also visually impaired and has a company. So you might recognize his voice from Bard books, from TV shows and movies. And he's been highly successful at that. So these are some of the things that we can do when we empower ourselves. For those looking to connect with Thomas Reed, you can find him at Read My Mind. Um, and Crystal also has an organization, Eyes Like Mine. So once you get a little further in your journey after you lose your sight and you find your community, you start to create opportunities, join teams. We have Goal Ball in the house. We have blind baseball in the house. There are so many different um, groups that will welcome you. I know firsthand that these guys are incredibly communal. They're incredibly helpful. They're a wealth of knowledge. And so we'll continue with the next person, but I want you to be encouraged and know that even within this space, there are members of other organizations that are willing to help you on your journey. Anyone else? I think that might've been, oh, no, there are more. Okay, we'll take this last one and then we'll make some announcements. Uh... Brian ran off. Brian. I've got the microphone. <laughs> if anyone has Zoom. If you're on Zoom and you have questions, please raise your hand really yeah. quickly. I'm gonna look. We're gonna get our last question inside. Look. There's a question over here. Hello, my name is uh, Black Beauty, and I'm just here, you know, to uh, represent our organization. New York. No, my name is Lamar Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but I registered under Black Beauty because I like to just play around and have a good time. But um, I'm glad glad to be in this space. Um, we also I'm here with my buddy Jaron. We uh, play goalball, so we um, 
have met through community and sport. So another opportunity, another avenue apart from technology is like through sports and activities. Like uh, I've gotten to travel internationally to compete in various sports, you know, from running, triathlons, goalball, what have you. So another sense of community is through athletics. Cause a lot of times I think in our community, we get really complacent with our, with our physical health and are not mindful of that. So I just want you guys to be open-minded to, uh, to athletics as an opportunity, especially adaptive sports, you know? So if anyone has any questions or something, we're here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Brown and Black. Thank you. Thank you. We, we actually had one more. A okay. couple more. One more. My name is Mary Burns, and I just wanted to make a plug for the library. Nobody's mentioned the Andrew High Scale Library. Great resources there and easy and lots of volunteers to help. So thank you. Thank you so Great. much. There's lots of New York City. There's there's and right. all over the country. All over the country. There's another question? No. Okay. No, we're gonna just Okay. Um, I'd like to make a couple of announcements while we're checking to see if there are any questions from Zoom. Speaking of adaptive athletics, the Lighthouse Guild will be hosting a blind baseball clinic on Sunday, August 27th. So for those of you who are interested in just trying it out or seeing it, please come out to this event. It is a family-friendly event. It is free. You do have to register. So that registration link is available on the Lighthouse Guild page. Um, we'll have food, we'll have fun, we'll have members of Team USA, the bronze medal winning Team USA, which I'm a member of. Shameless plug. Woo! Thank you. The USBBA in partnership with the Foreseeable Future Foundation and under the support of Lighthouse Guild will be hosting this event. It is Sunday, August 27th. And if you are really serious about pursuing adaptive athletics, We'll be having a series of grant workshops for individual athletes that are interested in applying for these grants that are $1,500 that will allow you to buy the equipment to travel overseas or to, or to have specialized training. Um, so if you're interested in any of those things, please see me afterwards and I can give you information about registering for that fundraiser and that really fun clinic. Do we have any questions, Brian? Uh, I think... I wanted to make a comment as well, but I see Fitz wants to say something. No, you can go ahead. No, uh, you, I can go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to mention, you know, earlier we talked about the programs here at Lighthouse Guild, and definitely one thing all across the country that people could partake in is telesupport. So one thing that's taught us is that we can all, you know, just get on a computer and meet others and get the support that we need. So we have telesupport here for adults, for parents of children who are blind or visually impaired, as well as teens. So if anybody wants to do any telesupport anywhere, you know, that's possible. And that's what's great about it. Thank you. Sure. Last minute thing. So we're gonna start to wrap up this portion of the panel in discussion. I would like to thank the members of the fundraising development team, marketing team, the volunteer services, especially those of us, Angie, and Jeremy and myself that are actually visually impaired people getting work done and changing policy here within this company and in our community. We're so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you.